to the 3 ABN Spring Camp Meeting, the Three Angels Messages. We are so glad that you are joining us, no matter if you're watching by television or radio or if on the internet, on YouTube, wherever you're joining us from, we're very happy to have you. But we're also happy to have all of you here, and this is a lively crowd. Can we say praise the Lord? Praise the Lord! I didn't even need to hold this out. Well, this hour is going to be special because the speaker is my pastor, John Lone McCain. He is a precious man of God, a man of prayer, great Bible teacher, wonderful singer. And he is going to bring us Revela the message of Revelation 14, 12, the patience of the commandment keeping saints. But before he does, we have Tim Parton, who is the... General Manager of the Praise Him, 3ABN Praise Him Music Channel. And he is going to sing, I Can Only Imagine. Thank you, Tim. I can only imagine what it will be like when I walk by your side I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me I can only imagine I can only Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in awe of you be still? Will I stand in your presence, or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all I can only imagine? can only imagine I can only imagine when that day comes and I find myself standing in the sun I can only imagine when all I will do is forever and forever worship you I can only imagine oh. surrounded by your glory what will my heart feel will I dance for you Jesus or in awe of you be still will I sing hallelujah or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. Oh, I can only Father, Lord, we don't want to imagine we want to be there. Lord Jesus, send the rain, 
send your Holy Spirit. Consume our hearts. Get us ready for that day. I just want to be faithful. I just want to be in that number. Speak to your people today, Lord Jesus, that we won't have to imagine, but that we will be there. In Jesus' name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. You see, here are they as a response to the question, where are they? So come with me now to the celebration of the ages. Heaven has been planning this announcement for more than 6,000 years. This is the event that strengthened Jesus on his road to the cross. He saw down through the ages when the saved, when the redeemed, all those that have struggled for the cause of Calvary was standing on that sea. He looked down through the portals of time and saw his blood shed and lives transformed and people changed, broken at the foot of Jesus. When Jesus walked the road to Calvary, this is the event that he saw. It was not the pain of the whip. It was not the accusation of the angry crowd, but he saw, he saw the redeemed standing he heard himself saying, here are they for which I have died. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. When Jesus cried, it is finished. The invitations of the final celebration were being mailed. When Jesus cried, it is finished. Emails were sent out to every nation, to every kindred, to every tongue. And to every people, they have been waiting for this day. And now the day has come here. Here are the patience of the saints. Here are they that by God's power keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. You see, friends, this is where the attention of Jesus is focused in only one direction. Matthew, the converted tax collector, writes these words. He says, then shall the king say unto those on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And then a ragged group, no longer looking like they used to look, now covered in the clothes of righteousness, no longer remembering how they fell in the past, but how they stand in the present, no longer looking at their failures, but at their victories, no longer remembering how hard the journey was, but how sweet the destination is. Here they are standing, no more signs of pain and suffering, no more sleepless nights and tear-stained eyes. Here are they, so unrecognizable that someone taps John the Revelator on the shoulder and he says, then one of the elders answered and said to me, Revelation 7, verse 13 and 14, who are these arrayed in white robes, and where do they come from? And I said to him, Sir, politely, Sir, you know, these are they that have come out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. They don't even look like they used to. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. Sometimes I get discouraged when I look at who I am, but I look in the mirror and I recognize that God is not done with me yet. Amen. Jesus is not done with us yet. Yes. Beloved, now we are the children of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we do know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. One day these hands of mine will touch the hand of God. Yes. One day this frail 
frame of humanity will be clothed in the glorious immortality of Jesus. I look forward to that day. This morning when I was walking out of my house, I heard that song I can only imagine. And I was overcome with not the imagination, but with the reality that one day I'll be standing there. No more imagination, no more songs, but I'll be singing it. I'll be looking in the eyes of my Redeemer saying, thank you. Thank you for not giving up on me. Thank you for not turning your back when I fell. Thank you for sending Jesus to bring me up to where I am now. And I can hear that day like horses hooves in a restless corral. The universal audience of all the unfallen worlds gather together to witness the power of the redemption of Christ. Brothers, this is not Carnegie Hall. This is not Radio City Music Hall. This stage dwarfs the 150,000 seat stadium in Pyongyang, North Korea. This stage built by the blood of Christ. This stage bought by the broken body of Christ. This stage is where the redeemed will stand. And they won't sing about their works, but about his works. They won't sing about what they've done to get there, but what he has paid for us to come into that place. The admission is being paid today. There is no sense in being lost when everything has been put together for us to be there. When Jesus raises the curtain, demons are forced to fold their wings in defeat. When Jesus points to the redeemed, demons are helpless, powerless. They have seen that they have finally lost. And standing front and center, clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. And he says, here are they. Here are they unmoved in a shaken world. Here are they untouched by the compromise of darkness. Here are they, heaven's evidence that the commandments of God can be kept. Yes. The prophetic declaration of Isaiah the prophet now comes to pass. Isaiah 60 verse 1 and 2 is now echoed and re-echoed through the universe. Arise and shine for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you and his glory will be seen upon you. Hallelujah. In this unfolding scene, the character of Satan is finally and completely exposed. He is a liar and the father of it. Amen. For 6,000 years, Satan has sown hostility against God's commandments. For 6,000 years, Satan led supposedly religious men to preach against God's law. For 6,000 years, Satan led men to exalt tradition above God's law. But when he points to this redeemed host, there they are by my grace. They can do all things through Christ who strengthens them. The prophet Ezekiel describes Satan's agenda in the following passages. Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 26, he says, Her priests have violated my law and profaned my holy things. They have not distinguished between the holy and the unholy, nor have they made known the difference between the unclean and the clean. And they have hidden their eyes from my Sabbath so that I am profaned among them. Ever since the entrance of sin, it has been Satan's determined purpose to rid the earth of those whose hearts are transformed by God's saving grace. He hates our identity. He doesn't like the fact that there's more power in the baby Jesus than there is in all the demons of hell. He doesn't like the fact that one drop of blood is more potent than all the artillery of hell. He doesn't like the fact he hates our identity, which brings me to a very important point. Don't abandon our identity. Amen. The three angels' messages challenges us, challenges the nominal spirit coming into our churches. It demands us to recalibrate our identity and our purpose. We are not just another church. Amen. We are God's remnant people. And I say that not with pride, but with a humble heart realizing that God can take sinners like you and me and give them a mission that increases their value in the eyes of heaven. Amen. He also dispatches to us divine aid. And he says the gates of hell will not prevail against that message. Preach the message like everybody's life depends on it. Amen. The three angels' messages challenges the nominal spirit coming into our churches. As I travel, my wife and I see our churches being chiseled away. It's being broken down. We don't want to be identified as we were before. Yes. We want to change our name, but what we don't understand is we are not just another name. Yes. 
Satan wants to render the message ineffective. And all he has to do to get rid of it is not to get rid of it completely, but to disguise it. You see, when King Saul was in apostasy, he disguised himself. When King Ahab was in apostasy, he disguised himself. When Josiah disobeyed God's counsel about not going into battle, he disguised himself. When the false prophet set a trap for God's prophet, he disguised himself. Satan wants God's remnant church to disguise themselves, but it's too late to blend in, my brothers and sisters. It's time for us to stand out. Amen. A city that's set on the hills shall not be hidden. A candle that lit is not to be put under a tree. God has raised this church up to be a sentinel in this world. God has raised this church up to stand between heaven and hell. And if we lose our identity, the world will be enshrouded in complete darkness. This is not just another church. But gradually, Satan has been eroding our identity. He's been trying to cover us with the camouflage of nominal Christianity, attempting to get us to blend with the surroundings around us. As I've seen our music changing, as I've seen our preaching change, as I've seen the way we dress now, as I've seen what Sabbath morning now presents as worship, our, our identity is changing, but I refuse to change. I'm not going back. I will not turn back. I know where I was. I'm not going back to that. I don't need to be like the world to get you to come to Jesus. We've got a message that must be proclaimed with hearts of humility, clothed in the righteousness, the righteous character of Christ. We must say God loves you, but he has standards. We must say Jesus will forgive you, but he won't leave you the way he found you. Stop saying he loves you the way you are. Finish the sentence, but he will not leave you how he found you. Satan's trying to get rid of our identity. You see, when you are no longer identified by your message, you're blending in. When your worship style is far into the truth, you're blending in. He wants us to blend in with the camouflage of nominal Christianity. He wants us to say, our message is like your message. No, no, my brethren, my message is not like your message. I got a three angels message. Try to find it. You won't find it anywhere but here. That's why 3ABN is committed to an undiluted, an undiluted, an undiluted message. It's too late to dilute the truth. It's too late to change the directions. It's too late to throw away God's GPS. He programmed it and it will get us where he said it will get us. Stop preaching foolishness on Sabbath morning. Preach about sin. Preach about redemption. Preach about the fact that God can change a life. Stop becoming comfortable with transgression and become comfortable with redemption. When preachers in our pulpit don't even embrace the truth, how do we invite preachers that don't, that, that don't even embrace the truth into our pulpits? We don't glorify degrees. We glorify the blood of Christ. I don't care what university you went to. If you're not going to heaven, don't come to my pulpit. I'm not rubbing shoulders with Pharisees and scribes just because you got a degree. If you're not lifting up the blood of Christ and the standard of truth, you're not preaching in this pulpit. Your fame on earth is not your fame in heaven. Your accomplishments on earth do not uh, qualify you to delete God's law. We're not like another movement. When the prosperity gospel replaces the everlasting gospel, we begin to blend in. But let me make it clear. God's got followers in every church. That's why God's got to keep the message clear. I never forget the words of Elder Brooks as he was fading away during the time of his cancer. He called me and he said, my brother, pray for an old sinner like me. I said, Elder Brooks, what do you mean an old sinner like you? He said, brother, let me just tell you something. I'm going to give you my parting words. And to this day, whenever I get discouraged, I press that button and he says to me, John, preach it. And when you're finished preaching it, preach it again. And make it clear. And make it even clearer. And make it strong. Don't dilute it. He says, God has called 3ABN for such a time as this. Don't back up. Amen. They may be down, but he's coming up. One day he'll stand with us. God's got other sheep that are not of this fold. But he says, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one fold and one shepherd. Not multiplicity, but singularity. You see, there are a lot of people in different churches, but Jesus is not content to leave them in darkness. They found him where they are, but he's not leaving them where they are. 
He's led them a certain distance thus far. But when the Lord says, he who has begun a good work will complete it, I believe it. Amen. We got people in our church that were, were Nazarene and Baptist and Pentecostal and Presbyterian and Methodist and Mormons. You know why they're here? Not because we're like everybody else. But because God has given us the icing on the cake. And I say that with humility. I don't say that because I'm better personally than anybody else. I know that. But God doesn't call a police officer because he has no bad background. God calls him to uphold a standard. God calls us to uphold the standard of right. God calls us even when we fall. A, a righteous man may fall seven times, but God will pick him back up again. Amen. So I'm not speaking about perfection in my own life, but perfection because of Jesus has covered me with his life. Amen. It's too late to change a statement into a question. You see, we're not a question mark. It's too late to change here are they into where are they. We are not Adventists. We are Seventh-day Adventists. Amen. A gradual erosion of our identity. Because everybody's waiting for Jesus to come, but everybody's not keeping the Sabbath. And I believe the Sabbath is a sign between us and God. He said it, and I believe it. Amen. A sign between us and Him that we may know that He's the God that sanctifies us. If you believe that, you'll honor the Sabbath. Amen. You won't ignore the Sabbath and say, I love the Lord anyway. That's foolishness calling his name, saying you love him. But the word of God says, he that says I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. That's God's word, not mine. And I'm going to preach that, but I'm going to preach it in love. You know why? Because I know where I used to be. I know every now where I sometimes fall. But God is not done with any of us yet. It's too late to change a statement into a question. We are not Adventist Christians. We are Seventh-day Adventist Christians. What people don't understand that just come along lately, we didn't just pick a name. Our name is not just another title. It's a message. Yes. When you tell the Muslims you're a Christian, they don't believe you. Tell the Muslims. We were over there. We were in Jordan. Muslims, you say Christian, they say you don't believe the Bible. But you say Seventh-day Adventist, they say, oh, the people of the book. Amen. When churches were being destroyed in Egypt, the Muslims stood back and watched it. But when they came to an Adventist church in Cairo, Egypt, the Muslims surrounded the Adventist church and said, no, that church belongs to our brotherhood. You know why they call us the people of the book? Because you keep the right day. But if you only keep the right day without the right relationship, you ain't going nowhere. You can have the right diet, but a clean colon and a corrupt heart still results in destruction. Revelation chapter 14, verse 12, points us back to our identity. When God points to that redeemed host, they are not disguised. It is clear who they are. Here are they. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they which keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. You see, here are they denotes not only uh, who they are, but it denotes faithfulness. You see, those who are standing there have not fallen into the pit of law versus faith. Let me make this clear for a brief moment. There is a deep theological reason why in that passage, commandments and faith are together. Because for thousands of years, Satan has pitted the commandments of God against the faith and grace of Jesus. He said, if you're saved by grace, you don't need the commandments. And somebody came along and says, yeah, if you keep the commandments, you don't need grace. Brethren, we need both. Amen. And this group, here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. You see, Ephesians 2.8 is clear about our salvation. The transaction of our salvation is not by our works, but by His work. Amen. For by grace... You have been saved through faith, and that, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. I can't boast about diddly squat. <laughs> to resurrect a New York colloquial, I cannot brag about anything. I'm saved by grace through faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ alone. Amen. 
but my salvation does not qualify me to abrogate God's requirements. Countless pastors and preachers have taught that by keeping the commandments of God, we are relying on works to be saved. But faith does not delete the commandments of God. The Apostle Paul, who himself said the law is holy and the commandments are holy and just and good, also said in Romans 3.31, do we make void the law through faith? God forbid. On the contrary, we establish the law. And so when people come along and say, oh, you're the law keepers, I'd rather be a law keeper than a law breaker. <laughs> what else is there? If your church is not keeping the law, what is it? It's a disqualified church. Because the Lord says to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it's because there is no light in them. I challenge any preacher, regardless of the size of your denomination, if you teach that God's law has been nailed to the cross, you need to sell watermelons. <laughs> you don't have a job. Amen. Salvation against salvation from what? If you teach the law is done away with, there is no sin. If there is no sin, there is no need of a Savior. Why are you preaching about a Savior when you say that the very thing that shows us we need to be saved is deleted? <laughs> Impotent theology. This nation has become diluted by its own constipated theology. <laughs> and what do we replace it with? Music. Make them feel good till hell's fire begins to warm their backs. Make them feel good until they cannot reverse the process of their meanderings down a river that ends at a waterfall of destruction. Make them feel good. But I say it like my dearly departed brother who's now resting in Jesus. It's not how high you jump, it's how straight you walk when you hit the ground. <laughs> Revelation 14, verse 12, those saints standing on that sea that day, they are a rebuke to those that oppose God's law. The perfect law of God cannot be kept by imperfect men, however. That's why Jesus came. How can imperfect people keep a perfect law? You know how? Jesus replaces our imperfection with his perfection. Christ in you, the hope of glory. You see, when, when, when they are identified, now bear with me, i got to break this down. Romans 8, verse 3 and 4. you got your Bibles, go there very quickly. You need this nugget. we got enough time. Romans 8, this is Shelley Quinn's and Jill Marconi's in my favorite book. The Apostle Paul breaks it down and he grabs you by your ears and says, you're not going anywhere. And you know he can grab me by my ears any day. Yeah. <laughs> Romans 8, verse 3 and 4. Look at this. He brings God's ability and man's frailty together and he shows us victory. He says, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. What the law wasn't weak, the flesh was weak. Yes. God did. What are those two words, my friend? What are the words? God did. Who did it? God did. How? By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. Don't miss that. Jesus did not come to destroy his law. He came to destroy our nature. He didn't come to destroy sinners. He came to destroy sin. Amen. Can I get an amen somewhere? Amen. He condemned sin. He didn't condemn us. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. We don't need to be condemned on Sabbath morning. We know we're already condemned. Amen. My message, my job, my calling is to preach no matter how far down you are, Jesus can, Jesus can save you from the guttermost to the uttermost. Amen. And I know that he found me in the guttermost of New York and standing on the uttermost of Thompsonville. Lord, have mercy. The biggest city in the world is right here. You thought it was New York. It's Thompsonville. <laughs> he condemned sin in the flesh. Verse 4. Get this. The verse 
that brings it all together. That's the righteous requirements of the law might be what? Fulfilled. So the, the law had requirements that we could not fulfill. But when Jesus came in and destroyed our sinful flesh and clothed us in his righteous flesh, when Jesus took out our carnal nature and clothed us with his glorious character, when Jesus vacuumed out our carnal spirit and filled us with the Holy Spirit, he found a way to get wicked men who used to be wicked to make them holy now. You know what? I'm not a sinner anymore. I'm a saint. Amen. If you're not a saint, why not? <laughs> Read the New Testament. Paul says, greet the saints in Ephesus. Greet the saints in Rome. If you are still a sinner, you're in trouble. <laughs> Jesus came not just to change our character, but to change our standing. Yes. You see, Revelation 14, verse 12, doesn't say, here's the patience of the sinners. <laughs> Amen. 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 Here is the patience of the... Saints. Stop walking around talking about I'm only human. Oh, no, my brethren, if you're only human, you will fall over and over again. Even though I fall every now and then, we fall down, but we get up. You see, if I fall down on my road to the Canaan land, I can get up and keep going in the right direction. You see, it's when you fall, if you change direction, you're in trouble. Amen. But if you fall while you're running toward the finish line, get up and keep on running. Amen. Running in the name and the power of Jesus. Amen. It says that the re righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled. What are the next two words? Yeah. Come on, say it with me. In us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Amen, somebody. Amen. Jesus did not come to destroy his law. He came to destroy our nature. He did not come to destroy sinners. He came to destroy sin. He shall save his people from their sin. And if Jesus can't do it, you're in trouble, and so am I. You see, Galatians 2.20 puts it all together. This, 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 this qualification had to come with the death of my old nature. The Apostle Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. I have been what, my friends? Crucified. When you walk with Jesus, you go first to his cross before you go to the resurrected life. You got to go to the cross. Amen. Then you got to go to the baptismal pool. Amen. Then you come out on the other side, clothed, able to walk in the newness of life. Amen. And then Jesus methodically and purposefully and completely begin to destroy everything that held you down. And one day you wake up and that sin no longer even causes you to flinch. One day you wake up and the thoughts are finally altogether gone. Because Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives where? If Jesus is living inside of you, what disables you from being righteous? He's living on the inside, not me. But until this human flesh, until this, until this Adam construction is replaced by the last Adam's construction, <laughs> until this mortal puts on immortality and this corruptible put on incorruption, until that day, Jesus is able to keep us from falling <laughs> and to present us before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. <laughs> but we don't preach that. We got the best message about righteousness by faith. And what do we preach? Lentils. <laughs> the life for not which I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You just missed it, but I didn't. I live by faith in the Son of God. Now, we thought that we live by our faith in the Son of God. I looked, at, I looked at that again and again and again, and you know what I discovered? I discovered this last night, which shows the power of the inspiration of God's Word. Sometimes God hides it from you until one day He says, Bah! <laughs> there it is. And you wonder where it had been hiding all that time. He hid it from you until He knew you could handle it. 
Last night he said to me, oh, no, we don't live by our faith in the Son of God. We live by faith which is in the Son of God. It's in him. It ain't in us. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of it's not faith in Jesus, but the faith of Jesus. The secret of the saints in Revelation 14, 12 is not that they have the faith to keep the commandments. It is the faith of Jesus in them that keeps the commandments of God. Amen. And so by preaching the three angels' messages of Revelation 14, we won't forget who we are. God's remnant message was not designed to be assimilated into the marketplace of monotonous theology. You know, same thing every week. How many times can you say, have fun? <laughs> Had a good friend who was a pastor in the Assemblies of God's Church, and I remember rooming with him as we were singing to the Heritage Singers together. He said, he said, I wish our church was like your church. I said, how so? He said, people walk in on Sunday, get baptized that day, and they leave the next week. Now, we've lost some too. But you know why we lose them? Because they hold on. They allow the cares of this life. They allow the cares of this life to become their focus. That's why the Lord says, look unto me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. Let me tell you something. If he started this journey, I believe he can finish it. Yeah. But so often we look at the, the bank balance and what our children did, and what our spouse did, and what the people at church say, and what the news said, and what Donald Trump says, who cares? <laughs> it's what Jesus said that's going to get into the kingdom. Amen. Forget about that conservative and liberal foolishness. So many Adventists are dis seduced by politics, this present administration. Somehow the last two administrations have awoken in our Adventist church a spirit of complacency and division. It's time to get back united, united on the message, Amen. not on politics. Come on, somebody. Amen. I watch Facebook, and I see Adventists arguing Donald Trump's position, and the other ones arguing Barack Obama's position. I'm arguing Jesus' position. Amen. I never found an answer in the White House, and I ain't going to find one. My answer's in the right house. Come on, somebody. Amen. My answer's in a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. Amen. My answer is in the man named Jesus. Who is he? The government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. You see, the, the nations are angry. They're angry because the devil's angry. When your life angers the devil, you know it's right. And the dragon was angry with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Revelation 12 and verse 17. So often I see, I see supposed Adventists on the internet arguing that the commandments of God cannot be kept. Well, if the commandments of God cannot be kept, then they ought to leave the church and go do the deepest sin because they won't be lost. But friends, that's not the truth. When you try in your own strength to keep that which is perfect, you will fail every time. But the problem is so many of us are arguing Satan's position and not God's position. From the first to the last, Satan has always hated God's law. If we trace the cadence of Bible history, we will discover that in each age, however, God has always had an urgent message, and he always found somebody to proclaim that urgent message. That's what this is all about. 3ABN is dedicated to preaching an urgent message. Noah was called to warn the world of an approaching flood. They said it never happened before, but it did happen. Lot was called to warn his family of the demise of Sodom and, Sodom and Gomorrah. Moses was called to proclaim a promised land focused message. But friends, God does not just call us out of Egypt. He calls us into Canaan. Amen. Today, we have to remember the saints of Revelation 14, 12 are a rebuke to those who live in complacency because 1 Peter 2 and verse 9 reminds us of our identity. Go there with me quickly. We got some time. On Sabbath morning, my church members wonder why I preach for an hour when I could preach for 50 minutes at camp meeting. I'll take what you give me. 
First Peter 2, verse 9. Who are they that stand clothed in the beauty and the canopy of Christ's righteousness? Who are they? Who are they? Who are they? Peter says he ought to know he used to be a big mouth. He used to have his mind in first gear and his mouth in fifth. But one day God synchronized his mouth with his heart and Peter became the spokesperson on the day of Pentecost. I believe that God can synchronize any sinner and make him or her a saint. Amen. So Peter is saying, but you are a chosen generation. What kind of generation? Chosen. chosen generation, a royal priesthood. We ought to get away from the idea that we were some kind of biological burp. We are not an accident. We are not somebody's explosion. We are made in the image of God. Amen. Holy nation, royal priesthood, his own special people. If you tell people on Sabbath morning they're special and they have a special mission, I believe they will begin to act like it. Amen. Why do he call them? Not to sit down. Stop singing, sitting on the promises. And start singing, standing on the promises. One preacher says we sing, standing on the promises while we're sitting on the premises. Why did he call us? That you may proclaim, that you may do what, my friends? Proclaim. You know what proclaim means? And I saw an angel flying in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth. And how did he proclaim it? With a loud voice. It's too late to have a quiet gospel. This message is not going to end with a whisper. My God shall come and shall not keep silent. Amen. A fiery stream shall issue and come forth from before him, and it shall be very tempestuous about him. Jesus is not coming back with a whisper. He's not going to say, shh, come here. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a what? Shout. With a what? Shout. With a what? Shout. With the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God. That trumpet is going to be so clear and distinct that the dead, that, that the dead are going to say, time to get up. <laughs> How long has it been since I first heard the Lord? How long? Has my heart felt no burden? They're going to say, how long has it been? And Adam's going to get up and his watch is going to say, it's been 4,931 years. <laughs> He's going to have a heavenly time mix that keeps on ticking. <laughs> when God calls Adam, He's going to come out clothed in the beauty of Christ's righteousness. <laughs> Proclaim the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His. What kind of light? This ain't no nickel dime flashlight. <laughs> this light will burn you up. The light was so great when the angels came to the shepherds in the field to announce the birth of Jesus. The Bible says an angel, an angel, an angel came to the shepherds and said, Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. But what they did not know is Jesus had secret service protection. And then Ellen White says in Desire of Ages, can I quote her here? Yeah. All right. In Desire of Ages, Ellen White says, the reason why the angel began with a singular conversation, just the angel and the shepherds, is because the angel had to wait for the shepherds to get used to the light. And when their eyes adjusted to the light of one angel, suddenly heaven raised the curtain. And there was with the angel a host of heavenly angels. You see, you may begin with one angel, but don't stop preaching because there are more angels waiting to shine the glory of God. The earth is lightened with the glory of God, his own special people to show and proclaim the praises of him who called John out of darkness, out of the clubs, out of the gambling halls of playing pool on Friday night, out of the 44th floor of the World Trade Center, disc jockeying with two turntables. He called me out of the trains of New York City going to a party on the Sabbath. He called me from behind the bars, drinking slow gin fizz and tequila sunrise. He called me from the streets of New York City. And not only did he call me once, but he had to brush me up every now and then. I said to my wife, when Jesus covers us with his righteousness, it's like a house being painted. And the house looks beautiful when it's painted, but sometimes there's a stain that shows up. And Jesus comes again with his paintbrush of righteousness and touches us up again. Amen, somebody? Amen. He's been touching me up more times than I can count. Amen. But when he's done, we're going to look like him. Come on, somebody, say amen. amen. Third point, 
Here are they denotes allegiance. Now let me make this clear. Beware of false Christ-centeredness. One of Satan's last attempts is to pit Christ against doctrines. Think about that. Churches talking about we don't preach doctrines. Then you need to, well, somebody else is selling watermelons. You sell cars. <laughs> For the word doctrine simply mean teachings. But Satan is now confused the churches today, churches of the world, churches of this world are becoming so much like the world that people of the world don't see any reason to join the church. <laughs> man by the name of Jim Ellis in an article called Christian Communication Worldwide, February 16, 2018, he said, I have been witnessing a new Conventional wisdom emerge. Simply stated, it is the wisdom of attempting to circle in more people for our churches by unashamedly minimizing or perhaps nearly eradicating the restricting influences of doctrines. What pastors used to do because they were poorly taught, they now do by intent in all of our churches. And they do it for the sake of church growth. In other words, they say if we minimize doctrines, our church will grow. Because you're in the airport don't mean you're getting on the plane. Amen. And he said the problem with it is, the problem with this minimization, it grows. So you got the mega churches and the giga churches, 50,000, 100,000, 30,000. You got them filled in the stadiums and they come for cookies and milk and cream and they leave just as spiritually dry as they got there. One pastor said, Doctrine does na doctrines do narrow things. And we don't like the word narrow. But the response from Jeff was, look to Jesus and Paul as perfect illustrations of how to teach doctrine correctly. If we teach the scriptures faithfully and exactly as they are stated, we will automatically teach good doctrines. Can I get an amen? amen. There's nothing wrong with narrow. Matthew 7, 13, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many that go in thereat. As the people of God, we have been given a priority message. Not because of who we are, but because of whose we are. The Lord didn't choose Israel because they were the best people. He chose them because he had a particular purpose for them. You see, the mailman that delivers my mail, the UPS, the FedEx workers, they're people just like us, but they got a responsibility. And we so recognize their responsibility that when they don't deliver our package, we complain. How much is heaven complaining when we don't deliver the message? How much is heaven complaining on Sabbath morning when God has given us a message and we don't deliver it? The three angels' messages are not intended to be blended messages. This message is to be preached over the babbling confusion of compromise. We don't lift up Jesus instead of doctrines. We lift up Jesus through the doctrines. If the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare for the battle? The three angels' messages are not preparing us for the final picnic of the ages. It's not preparing us for the final excursion or cruise of the ages. It is preparing us for the final battle of the ages. Amen. Put on the whole armor of God, but when you put it on, make sure you got your sword. Amen. Which brings me to my last point. When the Lord points to this group, he points to a group that is aware of the times. Amen. Listen to the times. I don't care what network you listen to, but you got to be comatose to not understand that we are on the verge of a stupendous crisis. Amen. Some of us are so involved in our stocks that we forget about what God is investing for us. Amen. You see, when Jesus said it is finished on the cross, a notice went out to start building my mansion. When Jesus said it is finished, the envelope containing the dimensions of my mansion was opened. When Jesus said, it is finished, an echo echoed throughout the courts of glory, and the angels came back and said, he said, his part is finished. Now our part starts. And Jesus took a little nap in the garden tomb. And he got up on Sunday morning. You know why he got up on Sunday morning? You know why he got up on Sunday morning? To start working for you and me. Amen. We have such a high priest. Amen. We have, he ever lives to make intercession for us. What do you say? Amen. 
When you, when you fail and you feel like you don't matter, when you feel like everybody's turned their backs on you, we have a high priest who ever lives to make intercession for us. <laughs> they are aware of the time. And the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 13, verse 11 to 13, and do this, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. If the Apostle Paul said it in his day, how much closer are we now? He said, therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. And let us put on the armor of light. The three angels' messages reminds us that it is high time for this dark and meaningless world to come to an end. It is high time to stand up for the truth or you'll fall for tradition. It is high time to straighten up so that you can walk right. It is high time to speak up for the cause of Christ. Can somebody say amen? amen. The saints of Revelation 14, 12 are the real deal. They are the finished product of divinity. Amen. You know, I think about this whole thing called Christianity. Every now and then I get kind of downcast when I think of my own journey. You ever get there sometimes? Amen. You ever get there and say, Lord, am I going to be able to make, have I done enough to get in? And then I realize, wait a minute, John, it's not what you've done, it's what Jesus is doing. Amen. It's not what you've done, it's what Jesus is doing. You see, that's why that passage in, in, in 1 John 3, he said, Beloved, now we are the children of God. When, my brothers and sisters? Now. Then he says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. But when you stand on that sea of glass that day, when that Redeemed host stands front and center, and the unfallen worlds peer over the balcony into the final performance. They say almost in chorus, Jesus was right. Amen. Every now and then the angels say to Jesus, are you sure you want those Adventists up here? <laughs> are you sure you want those Baptists up here? And Jesus turns around and says, I'm not finished yet. <laughs> Amen. I'm not done yet. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. The saints of Revelation 14 are the real deal. They are the finished product. You see, here are they is a response to the question, where are they? And so, my brothers and sisters, the day is coming when we will stand. When we will stand. What we have preached will become sight. What we have believed will become tangible. Faith will no longer be the banister on which I land, or on which I lean, but I'll be leaning on the shoulder of Jesus. The day is coming when we're going to sit down at the welcome table. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. And they're going to bring my glass of heavenly ale. <laughs> and they're going to say, this is the water from the river of life. Have a drink. Amen. Relax, John. Your journey is over. Amen. And they said, when the meal is done, we'll take you to your apartment. <laughs> and by the way, we heard you talk about them so much, we built you one right next to Elder Brooks. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And then the first Sabbath, the first Sabbath, we're going to get up on Sabbath morning and realize our clothes are already made. Yeah. We're going to say, did you get my suit ready, honey? She's going to say, no, Jesus did. Yeah. Amen, somebody. Yeah. Do you need shoes? No, honey. You don't need the car. We're going to fly to the worship service. <laughs> Amen. And from the north and the south and the east and the west and every coordinate in there, the white and the black and the walls of Mexico will finally be brought down <laughs> because the walls of Jerusalem have replaced it. Amen. It's not going to be about nationality. It's not going to be about language. But every nation, every kindred, every tongue, every people will stand before the throne of grace. And Jesus is going to stand out and somebody is going to say, he doesn't have a Bible. And somebody's going to say, he doesn't need one. He is the living word. Yeah. To God be the glory. And standing firmly that day, there will be a group 
of which there'll be no doubt. Somebody's going to say, who are they? And somebody's going to say, these are they that cannot be bought, compromised, deterred, lured away, turned back, diluted, or delayed. Who are they? These are they that will not flinch in the face of sacrifice. They will not hesitate in the presence of the adversary. They will not negotiate at the table of the enemy. They will not ponder at the pool of popularity, and they refuse to walk in the maze of mediocrity. Amen. Who are they? They won't give up. They won't back up, they won't let up, and they won't shut up until they have preached up and prayed up and paid up and stored up and stayed up for the cause of Christ. Who are they? Here are they. Come on, say it with me. Here are they. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they which keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And by God's by God's determined grace, where's Tim when I need him? <laughs> by God's grace, by God's grace, I won't have to imagine. Amen. I will be there. Yes. When the heavenly band steps out, in the background I begin to hear the instruments clanging together as the angels lift them to their shoulders. And they begin to play the song of Moses and of the Lamb. And Jesus stands out and taps as a faithful conductor. He says, To God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world that he Praise the Lord. 